IS. Together with Bonnie Glaser, who is over here, uh, who is the director of CSIS's China Power Project, we're hosting this morning's program that will focus on the evolving role of Taiwan in development assistance in Latin America and the Caribbean. We will also be hearing about a new initiative that is linking these efforts uh, with involvement by the United States uh, with uh, a number of other like-minded countries as well as the Inter-American Development Bank, the World Bank, and other multilateral development banks. We're pleased to have a very senior level of representation from both Taiwan and from the US government. We're particularly pleased to have Ambassador Timothy Xiang, the Secretary General of Taiwan's International Cooperation and Development Fund, ICDF. With that, I'd like to turn the floor over to, to Bonnie. Bonnie is a senior advisor uh, for Asia and the director of the China Power Project. She's a recognized specialist in, in Asia Pacific security issues with a focus on China's foreign and security policy. She's written extensively on these issues and has worked at both the US defense and state departments as well as in academia. Bonnie. Thank you, Michael, and thanks to all of you for uh, coming today for what I know is going to be a terrific event. Uh, and we have a lot of speakers, but before we get to uh, our keynote speaker, we're going to invite two uh, special guests up one at a time uh, just to make a few remarks. And we're going to start with Ambassador Stanley Gao, um, who, as most of you know, is the representative of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office, TECRO, here in Washington. He's been here almost two and a half years um, and has really helped take the U.S.-Taiwan uh, relationship from strength to strength in a broad range uh, of issues. I'm very glad that he could join us today to make a few remarks, so please come up, Ambassador Gao. Well, thank you very much, uh, Barney and uh, Michael, and uh, for this very kind introduction, and the CSIS for, this, for putting together such a key and a timely uh, event. And of course, I'm deeply honored to be here on behalf of TECRO. Uh, exactly, you know, almost just past three years mark here in Washington, D.C., and the surviving. And uh, so, uh, first of all, I'd like, me, uh, I'd like to talk about, you know, it seems like only yesterday when I joined uh, Taiwan's Foreign Service, this time 40 years ago, and uh, 2019 also marked the 40th anniversary of the Taiwan Relations Act, a rock solid cornerstone and a renewed milestone that has shaped American strategy in Asia and affirmed the strategic importance of the enduring partnership between our two countries. And over the past four decades, we have witnessed the unshakable and unmistakable bounds in our cooperation and the collaboration on a host of bilateral, regional, and global issues, ranging from security, defense, trade and investment, freedom of religion, counterterrorism, North Korea, and human rights. And just to name a few recent examples, in addition to President Tsai Ing-wen's most successful transit in New York and Denver just two months ago, we also welcomed some major arms sales packages to Taiwan worth over 12 billion US dollars, including new fighter jets, tanks, and other defense systems, and our agricultural goodwill mission again just last week, purchased 3.7 billion US dollars of soybeans, cones, wheat, and meat products. And Taiwan's, Taiwan's China Airlines also announced procurement of six Boeing 777s cargo aircraft worth over 2 billion US dollars. And we co-hosted the first US-Taiwan consultations on democratic governance in the Indo-Pacific region in Taipei just last month, and not to mention the grand opening of the state of art, brand new, high-tech, green AIT compound in Taipei. And thanks to the US administration 
and the robust bipartisan support of the U.S. Congress, our close partnership has been extended well into Latin America and the Caribbean, where we work closely with our diplomatic allies and have contributed significantly for the region's development in one way or another. And Taiwan's state-first diplomacy focuses on long-term assistance for mutual benefits. We're always sincere and never make flashy, hollow promises. And we share the same commitment as the United States to promote sustainable economic growth, good governance, transparency, and a vibrant civil society to meet the needs and the aspirations of our mutual friends in this hemisphere. And beyond Taiwan's diplomatic ties, we also share the vision, for instance, about a free and democratic Venezuela by providing humanitarian assistance to the people in desperate need. And we have delivered what we promised, as I did on behalf our government just a few months ago here at the OAS Organization of American States headquarters. And my foreign minister, Joseph Wu, personally handed over 3.5 tons of urgently needed medicine and other supplies to the representative of President Guaido's government. Another unequivocal case in point. So Taiwan, as a vital partner of the United States and the force for good in the world, we stand ready to promote our shared values and defend our common interest in the Indo-Pacific, in Latin America and the Caribbean, and frankly, around the globe. And the rest assure that Taiwan can help and will continue to punch above its weight and give back to the international community as we should. So thank you very much again for having me this morning. And I wish today's conference most stimulating, inspiring, and a great success. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Gao. Our next special guest uh, is uh, from the U.S. Department of State. And we're very pleased to have very strong representation from the State Department today. Uh, to really showcase, I think, the cooperation between the United States and uh, Taiwan in uh, Latin America. So our next speaker is uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs, uh, Mr. Kevin O'Reilly, um, who has served in a, a number of uh, really key areas and positions uh, in, uh, in his career in the Foreign Service. I will just mention a few of them. He was Director of the Office of Brazil and Southern Cone Affairs. He was Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Panama uh, City and uh, served at the National Security Council, Homeland Security Office, um, and the Pentagon, all on a range of issues, and really has vast uh, expertise that he, of course, brings to the table. And we're thrilled that he, uh, he was able to uh, come to us today and uh, offer views uh, on behalf of the Department of State. So please, Mr. Uh, O'Reilly, if you would come up to the podium. That guy must be good. Uh, thank you, sir, for those, uh, for those remarks. Uh, and Mike and Bonnie, uh, Secretary General Xiang, it's, it's great to be here with you and uh, with all our friends and colleagues gathered together this morning and uh, I guess watching online as well. Uh, this morning, we've, we've got a really great opportunity uh, to talk about the large and, and growing leadership role Taiwan plays in promoting development in Latin America and the Caribbean. And I'd like to share uh, a little bit about the way we view Taiwan as a democratic development partner in the Americas. It's a shining example of development. It went from receiving U.S. development assistance in the 1950s and the 1960s to becoming a 
uh, a strong and prosperous economy in its own right, now able to offer development assistance to others. Today, Taiwan, an island of a population of about 23 million people, is our country's uh, 11th largest trading partner and the eighth largest market for U.S. agricultural goods in the United States is Taiwan's second largest trading partner. Taiwan has made significant contributions to addressing global and regional challenges, and the relationship between the United States and Taiwan has deepened, rooted in shared democratic values. Launched in 2015, the Global Cooperation and Training Framework is a joint U.S.-Taiwan initiative and a platform for expanding cooperation in several critical areas, from public health and women's empowerment to law enforcement and humanitarian assistance and, uh, and disaster relief. The United States is pleased to collaborate with Taiwan to support the development uh, aspirations of our partners in the Americas. This past May, Taiwan and the United States Overseas Private Investment Corporation worked together to support Paraguay-based Banco Regional's efforts to provide lending services to small and medium-sized enterprises, especially those that are women-owned. In international organizations where the United States and Taiwan are both members, including the Asia Pacific Economic uh, Cooperation Forum and the World Trade Organization, we look for new opportunities to strengthen our cooperation on issues of mutual interest. The United States welcomes this same cooperation in Latin America and, and the Caribbean. As a society that celebrates freedom of speech and of the press, Taiwan is particularly well positioned to help Latin American governments grapple with the challenges of protecting freedom of information while enhancing their infrastructure uh, for information and communications technology. And I look forward to hearing uh, Secretary General Xiang and, and your thoughts um, on how Taiwan can partner with governments in this region to strengthen their technology safeguards. The nations of the Americas have made great strides to counter corruption, which is the Achilles heels of our hemisphere. Taiwan has uh, also has much to contribute to Latin American and Caribbean legislators to help parliaments uh, codify transparency as an essential inoculation against bad deals and, and, and graft. The United States opposes unilateral changes um, to the, to the cross-strait uh, status quo. We remain committed uh, to the U.S. one China policy, the three joint communiques, and to our responsibilities under the Taiwan uh, Relations Act. This has enabled us to maintain a, a broad, full range of interactions with Taiwan, including visits, trade negotiations, and education and cultural exchanges. Taiwan is a reliable partner, a democratic role model, and a force for good in the world and here in our region. It adheres to international standards on development, infrastructure investments, labor, environment, and human rights. The United States will continue to support Taiwan, especially as it seeks to expand its already significant contributions to addressing global challenges. So I'm going to stop here, and I look forward to hearing from the speakers and the panelists. I think, I'm sure we're going to have a, uh, an interesting and, and really useful conversation and discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Das Riley. So now we're going to have our uh, keynote uh, speech. Um, we are very pleased uh, to have with us uh, <coughs> Timothy Xiang, the Secretary General of Taiwan's International Cooperation and uh, Development Fund. Uh, Secretary General Xiang um, has led this agency since uh, 2016. Um, he has served in the United States, in Singapore, in Kuwait. He was also formerly ambassador uh, to Nauru and was the program director of Chinese Taipei in the APEC uh, Secretariat. Uh, Secretary General Xiang 
has a wealth of experience in international foreign aid policy, um, focuses also on, on trends uh, overall in international development aid and leads projects uh, with stakeholders from a diverse range of uh, cultural, organizational, and international backgrounds. So we are all going to get a great education because he's got a terrific slide deck. So please join me in welcoming Secretary General Xiang. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's really my privilege to address this occasion to share our story with the friends of Taiwan. Uh, every year, actually, Taiwan SDF has been working in Latin American, Caribbean, Asia, Pacific, and Africa for more than 20 years. And there are more than 100 Taiwanese technicians uh, go to overseas to work with local people and establish profound relationships face-to-face -face with the people thousand miles away from home. This kind of relations is a showcase of what we job is doing, but only part of it. And actually, but already good enough to show that we support our partner countries, also the contribution to the national community. And the following presentation, I'm going to show the whole pictures of what we do in Latin America, especially in Latin America and the Caribbean. This is the outline of my presentation. First, I'm going to introduce the overview of what the SDF is. And then, what we're going to do, what we do in Latin America and the Caribbean at different levels. Then I will conclude with some suggestions. Taiwan sent its agricultural mission to Vietnam in 1959. And in the 1960s, actually, there's a number of technomissions have been sent to every country to support their agricultural productions. And so there is a different organization was established to monitor the operation of these technomissions. And in 1989, because Taiwan's economic development have written, reached a certain stage, so this International Economic Cooperation Development Fund was established to provide financial services. But in order to manage well of the offshore development assistance, so in 1996, government merged the two entities into one. And then the International Cooperation and the Development Fund, Taiwan ICDF, was established in that year. So Taiwan ICDF played a very critical role in Taiwan's of your development assistance. And we are dedicated to boosting social and economic development, enhancing human capitals, also promoting economic relations in a variety of partner countries and by providing financial services, capacity building, also technology. And all main objectives to support overall development of our partner countries by four organizational strategies which are, sorry, which are drawing on Taiwan's comparative advantage, strengthening corporations, uh, cooperative partnerships, integrating public and uh, private sector resources, responding to partners' countries' needs. And we actually, our projects are tailor-made to the local needs of each country. And we covered a variety of current contemporary development issues and we select agriculture, environment, public health, and education ICT as our priority areas. And we further break down our priority strategies to food security, road development, climate change, marine sustainability, health promotion, capacity building, good governance. Now we have around 100 ongoing projects in 36 countries, and there are 21 technical missions with around 250 professionals in the field. And all these projects we can divide to fit four categories, education and the training, lending and investment, humanitarian assistance, and the technical cooperation. And all these projects are aligned with SDGs. During a reception in Paraguay, President Tsai Ing-wen, he said, although 
Sorry, I'm not used to this. <laughs> uh, during the reception in Paraguay, the President Tsai Ing-wen says, although we are geographically distant, we share the same values and a strong desire to build a better future for the people. We will work closely with our partners in continuing to strengthen democracy, peace, and the rule of law. Actually, what she said just reflects the nature of our strategies in the world. And actually, Taiwan shared the same development start point with Latin Americans and the Caribbeans. In the beginning, we focused on the primary industrial development with international assistance and the further toward industrialization of economy. So we focus on the provision for domestic needs. First, then we're trying to explore opportunities in the international trade. And just uh, President said, the goal of our strategy is trying to establish the open and the stable, sustainable economy. And a prosperous economy is inclusive, democratic, and peaceful, which is the value shared by Taiwan and the like-minded countries. And in order to achieve these goals, we implement projects for rural development and economic growth, human capital development, good governance, and health for all. This is the first case that I would like to introduce. This is a third three-party cooperation. This happened only a few months ago. I think the earlier, the, Mr. Earlier also mentioned that one. It's a cooperation between USA, Taiwan, and Paraguay. It's a small loan financing, and Taiwan's part is going to provide technical assistance for human capacities. Also, the awareness enhancement for women business. This is the first case, three-way cooperation. And now <clears throat> we have operations in Belize, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Honduras, Haiti, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, the Grenadines, the Paraguay, and the Ecuador. For the road development and economic growth, we focus mainly on primary industry and SME development. For our support to the agricultural and agricultural projects, we want to make sure that partner countries can provide for domestic needs then have extra to export to international market. You can see from the chart, this, this is our main focus and recognizing the economical growth is a key foundation for the development. I would use the Honduras expanding avocado seeding production project, for example. Everybody knows avocado is a superfood with high quantity of nutrients and antioxidants. And we provide the latest technology to facilitate, the, to facilitate, to improve the facilities for seedling, uh, avocado seedling production and also strengthen the capacity of local technical staffs. We also have to standardize operating procedures, create the platforms for a uh, traceability platform for avocado seedlings. And the target of this project in three years is trying to produce 100,000 seedlings, and the promotion area will be 1,000 hectares. And at the end of the project should reach a target of zero avocado import with excess to export to regional market. And the Guatemala Papaya Export Project in Pekin is the one of the best practice of WTO aid for trade in 2013. And this project and this project started in 20, back to 20, uh, 2005 and ended in 2013, 2014. The Taiwan ICDF cooperated with Guatemala government to improve the papaya production by upgrading production process, increase uh, employment, also meeting international quarantine standards to increase export to USA and Canada. Now, five years after the project ended, Taiwan ICDF sent a post evaluation team and used the change theory to review the results of this project. Then we found the number of papaya production firms increased from 17 to 42, and the production area had more than doubled. 
and the, papaya, the amount of papaya export to USA had increased 300%. I think these are the perfect examples of how Taiwan ICD have assist partner countries to establish industrial tree. As based on the Taiwan experience, we know if we invest human capitals, we're going to reap tremendous rewards. And the human capitals is the foundation of the almost all developments. So we try to aim to use Taiwan's experience together with the sources from private sectors. We provide a platform for two kinds of education. The first one is formal education, that is to provide scholarships to the students to come to Taiwan to learn the issues addressed national development. We, in, the, in the category of non-formal education, we provide vocational training. You can see we teach those trainees in the areas of hospitality, bakery, motor, vehicle, mechanics, electrical, and electronics engineering. We also organize professional workshops, and those topics are all Taiwan's, based on Taiwan's experience and what Taiwan's are good at. And also we provide healthcare personnel training for improving those healthcare personnel skills and the knowledge. Also, we offered Mandarin teachers in different countries. Here's uh, some stories about the human capital development. There's a Mr. Juan Diago Prudot from Honduras. He graduated from the National Jiangsu University. He majored in IMBA program, and he was the winner of the 2015 Hold Prize among 20,000 candidates. And he founded the Impact Coffee, which have invested more than 300,000 US dollars in school establishment and enhancement, which benefited more than 400 students in the remote areas in seven countries. And there's a Miss Carolina from Paraguay. She attended the vocational training of maintenance of cell phone and APP improvement and development. And he received a certificate of level C in electrical and electronic engineering and ready to start her own business in the hometown. And the last one is Mr. Timor from Belize. He obtained a certificate of the healthcare personal training program, which was recognized by the National Nurse Association of Belize. Now he's qualified and be able to legally practice in dialysis in Belize. Here is the table showing how much we have done for the capital, uh, human capital development in Latin America and the Caribbean. For the scholarships we have uh, provided, almost 1,500 students to study in Taiwan, and uh, almost 500 for, we invite almost 500 participants to attend the professional workshops. We also have almost 350 trainees to receive the trainings from the vocational training programs. And for health personnel training programs, there's about 81. But if you notice, there is that other, uh, that part of others. It means those, the numbers are from non-diplomatic allies. It means in this area, Taiwan not only contribute, help our partner countries, also have other contribution to the region. In order to improve the accountability, transparency, effectiveness, effectiveness, effectiveness of the governance. Taiwan also put a lot of effort to support our partner countries to improve their good governance. By part of it, we transfer technology, including, including information and community technology and a geographical information system. Not only this, we also provide financial services related to the good governance. This is the projects in Belize. That's the Belize National Broadband Plan. Uh, Belize, in their national development plans, they want to update or say they want to change the existing facilities for internet service. So give it a loan to improve the quality of Belize internet service by supporting Belize Telemedia Limited in replacing older systems with the fiber optic network. 
and the quality of life for all the Brazilians and the efficiency of the government can be improved through easy access to speed internet service, which can lead to a governance in the country. And we know health for all is a very important component in the SDG, SDGs. So we implement seven public health projects in seven partner countries. And there are three in three areas. The first one is the maternal and the neonatal health. The second one is the capacity building for the prevention uh, non-communicable disease. And the third one is established health information system. And in order to increase accessibility to Mm -hmm. Oops. In order to increase the accessibility to health service, also want to reduce the waiting time for the patients, also want to enhance the database, also want to prevent the real-time inventory of medicine for doctors. These projects aim to improve the health administration and the information system. So there's a comprehensive information health system was established in 2016. And over the three years of continuing efforts, the difference is significant. Before and after, well, after the projects, the waiting time for the patients is from almost 90 minutes to 30 minutes. And for the registration per day, is from the 200 patients to almost double. 360. And for the doctors, treat the patients, they, they used to be only eight patients per day, now can increase to 20 patients. So except for the number improvement, and the most significantly is the patients, they feel the difference. Now they can enjoy the more inconclusive and holistic healthcare service. This is the very successful projects in Paraguay. Not only we strengthen our bilateral relationship by implementing those projects mentioned above. We also implement uh, regional projects for stronger partnership to deal with some complex development issues. Here is the projects that we implemented, but I'm going to use two for the examples. The first one is the prevention of Huanglongbing HLB, also known as the citrus greening disease. Citrus industry is a very important economic pillar in Central America, but this disease poses a great threat to this industry. If this disease cannot be prevented, then it might cost the loss the industry probably more than one billion US dollars. And because Taiwan has a very intensive experience in preventing this disease, so the International Regional Organization for Plant and uh, Animal Health, OISA, they seek out Taiwan ACDF's assistance. So we work with OISA to develop the prevent and the control measures in five countries where have been affected. Also, we work to prevent the spread of disease in two non-infected countries. And in this component, and the, project, the component of these projects include we trying to integrate, to implement, integrate the measures to control the spread in cultivation areas. We also enhance the detection measures. We also establish monitoring and the reporting system to respond to any outbreak. So through the technical assistance provided by Taiwan ICDF and OISA, this disease was successfully controlled. This is the first case. And the second one is the regional lending program for coffee roast in Central America. The aim was to support the recovery of production, the production capacity of small-scale coffee producers in Cabez, uh, Cabez founding members, countries, and that have been severely affected by a coffee roast epidemic. The program consists of agricultural loans and also technical assistance. And the project aims to plant, renew, and stumping and pruning to stop the epidemic of the coffee roast disease. I think now you all know our work. 
So I'm stop here. I'm going to conclude here. Uh, we hope that we can work together uh, with our like many countries and that we can work with ICDF to, by incorporating our existing projects into regional program. And we want to promote stability by ensuring there's no, cape, no gap across in the region. By replicating Taiwan's experience, uh, we believe we can help our partner countries to develop social and economic growth. And meanwhile, we would like to share our value of building peace, prosperity, and inclusiveness with our friends. And also with the help of the United States, like-minded countries, and the regional coherence, we are really willing to contribute to international development work and ensure that our shared vision continues to stay strong, not only throughout the Latin American and the Caribbean, also can spread to every corner of Indo-Pacific region. So we think action must be taken. The first, we think a platform should be established to exchange information and to ensure all stakeholders are in the same loop. And we would help you to work with other government aid agencies in the project level. And also we think a co-financing and the co-providing TA expand the project impact and benefit all stakeholders. For example, regional programs can be a great opportunity for like-minded countries to share the load and secure the regional consensus, make good use of the advantages of all partners. Take Taiwan, for example. We have the expertise and experienced staff who are familiar with developing work in developing countries. And last but not least, creating a strong alliance by including Taiwan ICDF into the global affairs, increase the participation of Taiwan ICDF in public occasions, such as international conferences or seminars, show the resolution that we would leave no one behind. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to address you all today. And I believe you all know that Taiwan can help, and Taiwan is helping, and will help. Thank you very much. Please come back. You're going to take a few questions. <laughs> I won't let you go quite that okay. easily. Sure. <laughs> Great. Maybe we can just move this over a bit. So thank you, Secretary General Xiang. Um, we just have time for a couple of questions. So um, if people would just raise their hands, um, make your question, please, very concise, um, uh, and identify yourself before uh, you ask your question. So any hands out there? OK. Please wait for the microphone. It's just coming your way. Thank you, sir, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, question, what relationship do you have with U.S. development agencies, such as USAID, the Peace Corps, Millennium Challenge Corporation, and others? Uh, actually, we have a working relationship with some un -IG I uh, NGO from the United States. But so working with the USAID, just the beginning, actually, we have a talk. Uh, probably one month ago, so probably we're going to start some kind of cooperation very quick. Okay, another question? Yes, right there. Thank you. Uh, hello, Secretary General. Uh, I have questions that uh, we all know that like, Taiwan have very difficult international situations. Or, so I was just wondering uh, how uh, you see to work through uh, NGO as opportunity to strengthen uh, and to strengthen or increase Taiwan ICDF, Taiwan ICDF's capacity, and then also I mean impact and also visibility. Thank you. I believe everyone you know the diff how difficult Taiwan is, especially facing the international environment. So Taiwan is there not only work with our partner countries, we're trying to work with INGOs. Because whenever we have uh, projects working together, usually we will not only enhance our 
capacities by knowing the local knowledge or the practice that the organization is doing. And the other important reason is because if we work with those NGOs, we're trying to share the visibilities because, you know, sometimes travel is not easy to be posted outside. So if we have a very good projects and we work with those NGOs, usually they will share our view that they always show our success, our um, contribution. This means it can make us more visible. That's what we have done so far with the NGOs. Okay, I think we're going to um, wrap up this portion of our program and have our panelists come up, and uh, I will invite uh, my colleague Michael Matera to moderate. Please join me once again in thanking Secretary General Xiang. Thank you very much, Secretary General Xiang. Um, we're very pleased to follow up um, these keynote remarks uh, with a, a panel discussion by a number of senior officials, both from the US government and, and from Taiwan. And we're going to finish up this panel with some uh, expert perspective that's going to be presented by uh, CSIS senior associate, Dr. Scott McDonald. Um, how can the United States, other major donor countries, and the multilateral development banks coordinate more closely with Taiwan in Latin America and the Caribbean? Um, this is the, the real question that's facing um, the U.S. government, like-minded governments, and, and the multilateral development banks uh, right now. The majority of countries that, that maintain diplomatic relations with Taiwan are in Latin America and the Caribbean, nine of the 15 countries that, that now um, maintain diplomatic relations are, are in our region. Um, but Taiwan's development assistance, um, we've learned, is not limited to these countries. Assistance coordination has been taking place already uh, for a number of years between the United States and Taiwan, mostly under what has already been, uh, has been referred to, this umbrella of the U.S.-Taiwan Global Cooperation and Training Framework, uh, GCTF. In recent months, though, US, the U.S. and Taiwan have begun efforts to expand this development assistance cooperation, which has been focused until now mostly in the, in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, to include now Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, this new joint work is already engaging a number of, of U.S. government agencies, including USAID and OPIC. Um, who are working with Taiwan's International Cooperation and Development Fund, Taiwan's foreign ministry, and its central bank. The Inter-American Development Bank and the World Bank and other multilateral development banks um, are also expected to be involved in this cooperation. So we're going to take questions after the panel presentations. Uh, we've passed out uh, index cards uh, that you can use to, uh, to send your questions up to us. Um, I'd like to first just introduce the members of the panel, um, and then we're going to turn to, to each one individually. Um, Christy Palekia is a senior advisor at uh, the U.S. Overseas Private Investment Corporation and is a senior representative at OPIC for its engagement in, in Latin America. Christy was just a few weeks ago um, part of a senior delegation uh, that traveled to Colombia, Argentina, and Paraguay. Uh, the delegation included Ivanka Trump, Mark Green, the administrator of USAID, John Sullivan, the Deputy Secretary of State, and, and David uh, Bohigian, the Acting President and CEO of OPIC. Before, working, uh, before coming very recently to work at OPIC, Christy, Christy spent five years at the Sumitomo Mitsui Banking Corporation, SMBC, where she built innovative ways to support the bank's lending businesses in the Americas. Before SMBC, she spent 10 years at PN, uh, PNP, uh, BNP Paribas, where she helped restructure the bank's exposure in the Americas during the global financial crisis uh, after 2008-2009. Uh, 
Bernardo Rico is a Deputy Assistant Administrator for USAID, responsible for Latin America's, uh, the Latin America Bureau's strategic approach to alternative development, private sector engagement, citizen security, the rule of law, and helping the Colombian government to implement its peace plan. Bernardo spent many years at the IFC, the International Finance Corporation of the World Bank, uh, prior to moving to USAID um, not too long ago. Ambassador Alexander Yui is the Director General uh, from Taiwan's uh, Foreign Ministry for the Department of Latin America and Caribbean Affairs. Uh, ambassador Yui is a senior career diplomat for Taiwan and has served as Taiwan's ambassador in Paraguay, the Director General of Taiwan's Economic and Cultural Office in Geneva. He has a bachelor's and master's degree from Texas A&M in political science and Spanish literature and has also studied at Harvard, at Harvard's Kennedy School. Mr. Chang, Mr. Chu Chang is the head of the New York Representative Office of the Central Bank of Taiwan. Uh, he has worked with the Central Bank since 1993 in various capacities and locations, including in London and Taipei. In 2012, he was appointed as Taiwan's director to the Central American Bank for Economic Integration, CABE, based in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. Uh, he has an MBA from Vanderbilt University. And finally, we're gonna hear from Scott McDonald, who is a CSIS senior associate and an expert on relations between Asia and Latin America. He is the chief economist at Smith's Research and Gradings, a financial services firm, and he's worked for various other asset management and economic research firms, including Mitsubishi. Early in his career, he worked as an international economic advisor in the office of the controller of the currency. Uh, he's the author of many books and articles on the Caribbean, Latin America, and Asia, has a PhD in political science from the University of Connecticut, a master's in Asian studies from the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies. So now I'd like to turn to, to the individual members of the, of the um, panel. I'd like to first turn to Christy um, Pelekia um, from OPIC. Um, Christy, if, if you could tell us a bit about what OPIC is doing or what OPIC plans to do together with Taiwan, um, perhaps share a little bit from your, your trip um, a few weeks ago. And we're also interested to know a little bit more about um, what is being formed in terms of the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, the DFC, um, that is going to be uh, launched uh, in the near future and uh, will be replacing OPIC as we understand it. Sure. Proceed. Thank you, Michael. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you to the panelists and to the many distinguished guests. It's an honor to be here this morning representing OPIC, so thank you. Um, regarding our, our relationship with, with Taiwan, we recognize, um, as Ambassador Gao said, said this morning, that we have many shared values between the United States and Taiwan. And we will continue to look for ways to help expand Taiwan's participation on global issues, including through development finance. Earlier this year, our president, Dave Bohegan, traveled to Taiwan and met with President, president Tsai and reaffirmed OPEC's commitment to partnering to support development. And Dave Bohegan likes to talk about the five factors that countries need to think about when they are considering development investment. And those are that projects need to be built to last, they need to respect the environment, they need to ensure transparency, they need to create jobs, and they, need, they need to respect a nation's sovereignty. And so we look forward to working with Taiwan to move those values forward in Latin America and around the world. And on my, uh, actually, uh, regarding trips, my first day at OPEC, I actually had the pleasure to meet this man uh, as I was in, in Paraguay. Um, OPEC and ICDF uh, partnered to support a uh, financing uh, that Kevin mentioned earlier that we did for Banco Regional uh, to make financing available to underrepresented uh, small and medium enterprises, which included a significant uh, percentage of women. And we specifically, uh, one, of the, one of the things that we really look to do, and, and we hope to do this more with, with our friends from Taiwan, is to make sure that we are 
focus on a gender lens. And Banco Regional has a, not only did the money go to women, but they have a significant uh, management team that's comprised of 30% women, which is remarkable, and a board of directors that's 20% women. So we look to partner on, on many of these projects to su support many of these principles uh, as we are today and, and as we continue to be around the world. Uh, as the DFC. And regarding the trip a few weeks ago, we were in Paraguay again, where we, um, we had the, the pleasure of, represent, of uh, being represented with, with Advisor Trump, who has done quite a significant amount to promote women. Uh, and she, with her help, we were able to uh, obtain another commitment between uh, OPEC as well as with Citibank. To, to mobilize $500 million for women uh, in the Americas. That's a total of a billion dollars that we've mobilized. And so we look forward to continued partnership uh, with our friends from Taiwan to that end. Thank you very much, Christy. I'd like to turn now to uh, Bernardo. Um, Bernardo, what the issue that um, has only been sort of alluded to here is, is that of um, China's involvement in, in Latin America and um, what appears to be uh, a gathering U.S. strategy uh, to, um, to address China's presence. We've had a number of, of programs here. Uh, in fact, a, a year and a half ago, David Malpass, uh, who's now the president of the World Bank, as you know, uh, but was undersecretary of the Treasury at the time, came uh, and gave one of the first uh, addresses uh, talking about the issue of China's presence in Latin America and beginning to describe um, the U.S. government's view of, of China's involvement, which is uh, uh, one that sees some of the positive uh, uh, outcomes, but also uh, sees the threats that are, that are presented by, by China. Um, I'd like to ask you to comment briefly on why China's rise to prominence and commercial prominence in Latin America should be a concern for the U.S. And, and what is USAID doing uh, in terms of, of addressing that? Um, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Michael and, uh, and Bonnie, for putting on this very important event for our partner and friend, uh, Taiwan. Um, definitely, China is a major component of what's happening in Latin America. Um, I don't think we would be talking about China if it was just a commercial um, issue or commercial rise to commercial prominence. You know, China now is the largest training partner for Ecuador, I'm sorry, for Peru, Chile, and Brazil. And over the last 15 years, it's lent about $150 billion through its development banks to the region. But unfortunately, this is only partially the story. Many of China's projects in the region have been of poor quality and involved corruption. Um, I think one of the most uh, egregious examples was the $18 million Coca-Cola dam in Ecuador, where poor engineering resulted in so many defects, including over 1,000 cracks in the dam that um, that the project actually had to be um, discontinued for a while, and nearly every top government official in Ecuador was either in prison or sentenced on bribery charges. Unfortunately, the Ecuadorians um, were still obligated to pay back the loans related to the project, which required them to produce or to use 80% of its annual oil revenues, which is now actually forcing them to go further into the Amazon, um, threatening even more deforestation. I think that's one prime example of poor quality and um, where corruption is involved, but I think China's negative influence probably takes on its worst manifestation if we talk about Venezuela quickly, where I think the interests of the United States and Venezuela's neighbors have been directly threatened. You have 4.3 million now Venezuelans who have fled the country because of the poor economic policies of Maduro and his predecessor, um, including the corruption, and that number is going to continue to grow. But again, in Venezuela, we're not just talking about a um, commercial involvement where it's the largest creditor with $60 billion, $60 billion of loans. China has also provided, and not many people focus on this, China has also provided loans for the armored vehicles used to suppress uh, protest under the Maduro regime. It's provided over $600 million in military weaponry, now supplanting Russia as the largest supplier through its telecom equipment company, uh, ZTE. It helped implement the Fatherland Identity Card that is required to, retain, uh, to obtain any medical or food support. Uh, and it's also used to spy on uh, Venezuela's citizens. And this is stuff that clearly our partner like Taiwan would never engage in. And I think lastly, it's just important to know that everything that China's been doing in Venezuela has been used to sustain the, the illegitimate regime of Maduro and um, along with allies, along with uh, maligned actors like Russia, Cuba, and even Iran. 
what we're doing at USID right now to address uh, China's involvement and kind of really trying to undermine what we see as our partner's journey to self-reliance in Latin America is a whole of government approach. I can't talk about a lot of the activities that we're or the initiatives that we're engaged in, but what I can talk about is what we're actually gonna focus on at USID, which is messaging more what our programs actually already do, our model of, de uh, our model of um, development and how distinct it is from the model of authoritarian dependency uh, of China. We at USID, we strive to make each country, ultimately is our administrator, Green says, um, independent of aid. That's the, that's the goal of the journey to self-reliance. So I think we don't talk about this enough, but going forward, we're gonna talk about how our programs in Mexico and Paraguay help to create more accountable governance and transparency. The Chinese don't engage in any such programs abroad, and quite honestly, their authoritarian system back home is quite the opposite. We have programs in Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua that promote democracy, human rights, religious freedom, civil society, and independent, independent media. And quite honestly, China is against all of this. And we have other such programs, so for example, and just in closing, in, uh, in Colombia and Peru, where we're working with poor rural farmers to move away from illicit activities like um, uh, coca cultivation and illegal mining with alternatives, sustainable alternatives, in the long run like cacao, uh, sustainable tourism, uh, dairy farming, and coffee. Oh, Bernardo, thank you very much. Ambassador Yui, um, I'd like to turn to you. Um, you have a lot of experience uh, having worked in Latin America. Uh, I'd like to get your assessment of this new effort um, on the part of Taiwan and, and the U.S. government together with some of the multilateral development banks. Um, give us your assessment of, of where this program is going. It's new. Um, uh, what is the potential? What is the potential given the, um, the overlay of, of the, the China-Taiwan um, uh, issue, the overlay of the U.S.-China issue? Uh, we'd very much like to hear your views. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Bonnie. And all the friends who made uh, this event possible. I'm very honored to be in this panel uh, talking about uh, what we can do in the area with uh, like-minded countries such as the United States. Um, uh, as you mentioned, this is a, a new uh, venture that we're, we're uh, uh, go, traveling along together, uh, but it's, it's uh, um, a, a, a work that is uh, uh, beneficial to both of us because, as I mentioned, most, most of our, well, almost a third of our allied countries are positioned in Latin America, and um, uh, the U.S. is trying to uh, contain PRC's uh, presence or aggressive stance in, in the area. So our work together, uh, it results in, in a common interest for both of us. Um, as uh, Mr. Riley mentioned before, there was, and also Christy, we had an, already an initial uh, co collaboration with OPIC back in May in Paraguay uh, with, with the credit, credit line to um, small and medium enterprise, especially on, on empowering women and businessmen. And this is an initial, uh, project that we started after some, uh, you know, talks, and, and with OPIC, we're also looking at other other places, Haiti, Guatemala, Honduras, etc., and, and try to find ways that we can work together. Uh, since this is rather new, so uh, the the way that OPIC or in, in the future uh, the the F the FC the FC will work, we're trying to get a hold of what 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 it, it will be in the future, so that maybe ICDF or other. Uh, agencies in Taiwan or partners uh, can can work together, but this this work is not only from from ICDF, uh, also for, or other government agencies, but also as uh, somebody from the from the audience also mentioned, uh, we have a very strong uh, NGOs in Taiwan that work also very actively uh, all over the world. Um, in 1971, when we were forced to leave the United Nations and and therefore we were excluded uh, from most of the international organizations, um, there has been a, a, a large frustration from Taiwanese people uh, ever since because uh, as we have received help from the United States and other countries before, we want to re uh, also do our part of work, you know, part of our responsibility in the international arena, but, but we are uh, not allowed to do so because we're not part of the international organizations. Um, but uh, we've done our part, you know, uh, uh, which is ironic because um, 
in most of the international organizations, they talk about the principle of universality. The, the, the ICAO last year's, or the last, last time model was leave no one behind. When we knock on the doors on the ICAO, they say, well, you said leave no one behind. Then, so we're here. You know, we want to join. We would like to be participating in the ICAO. They say, well, but you don't count. Uh, so, but why, why don't we count? Well, this, you know, it's, 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 you're different. But we're also humans, and we also uh, uh, we, we, we work, we live within this global village. So uh, we are very um, uh, high desire to participate with the United States and other like-minded countries, and specifically in landmark and in the Caribbean. But our work doesn't, uh, it's not just what uh, ICDF, uh, not only ICDF, which is already quite a lot, as, as uh, Secretary General Shang had, had, had presented to you just now, but we also work together with our, our allied countries in many, many other uh, projects. For example, in Guatemala, we're helping them to expand their uh, highway, for, uh, it's called CA9, from Guatemala City to Puerto Barrios, which is their port in, in the Caribbean. It's expanding from a two-lane to a four-lane highway. Uh, we help the St. Vincent and the Grenadines, an island in an island country in, in the Caribbean, and uh, we help them build the uh, Argyle International Airport. Uh, before that, uh, tourists had to hop from different places into St. Vincent, but after the air, uh, airport was completed, uh, now there are direct flights between uh, uh, St. Vincent and Grenadines and United States and Canada. So now, uh, the Sinvincian government is asking us to help them build hotels because there are so many uh, tourists going into St. Vincent that they need to expand their hotel, uh, uh, hotel uh, rooms. Uh, also, uh, in, in Paraguay, we're helping them. Uh, we're, we uh, established a, a, a Taiwan-Paraguay Technical University. We're betting on Paraguay. They're a thriving economy. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're growing economically. But, but uh, we're, we're betting on their uh, human capital to, to, uh, to uh, build future engineers in Paraguay using Taiwanese uh, professors. We basically moved the Taiwanese university into Paraguay with Taiwanese curricula in being taught in English. We're generating 100 engineers per year so that the, the, uh, Paraguay will be ready to receive uh, uh, more investments from, from, for example, Taiwan. Uh, and the other, and the other. So, so with United States, uh, there are many things that we can do. Uh, for example, uh, also you mentioned some. Uh, there was the mention of uh, GCTF. There's also something that has been done, being done in in, the, uh, in Taiwan, the United States. And I thought there's the first session being conducted in South Pacific. I think uh, recently or, or or in the near future. I, thought, I think we can do the same uh, uh, seminars in, in, in Latin America on, on issues that are of interest to Latin American countries, to Taiwan, and to the to, to, to United States. Uh, ICDF also has, as you, as you saw in the PowerPoint, conducts a, a wide variety of uh, training uh, sessions, and we can include some of the good governance uh, issues that the United States cares a lot about and include that in, in our uh, training sessions. There's just a few examples. USID, uh, we haven't, we also just initiated a contact, not, not, not long, in May, I think, of this year, but I hope that we also will, will uh, continue further discussions to see what we can do together in these other countries uh, that we can, you know. Uh, work together in projects that are, are of common interest, both to the United States, to Taiwan, and to, uh, to, to our allied countries. So actually, there's a lot we can do together. And hopefully, uh, this is a, a, a start of a very good road ahead. Thank you. Just one very quick follow-up question for you. We were talking before the, uh, the event began, and um, Taiwan maintains diplomatic relations with nine countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, but you have uh, relations um, with 19 or 20. So, I mean, there are other countries like Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, and others that, uh, that you maintain commercial, cultural ties with. Um, is any of this technical assistance that's being discussed now um, possibly going to take place in any of those other countries? 
Well, we concentrate most of, almost all of our resources into our allied countries, but there are exceptions, such as we have a ICDF project in Ecuador, I think it's oysters. And we've also had bamboo projects and so on and so forth. But we try to concentrate on our allied countries for, for, for good reason, but, but it's not exclusive. For example, also, Secretary General Sham mentioned that in the vocational, educational, uh, scholarships that we provide to, to friends in, in the area, uh, a good number of them are destined to uh, non-allied countries. Uh, I think the range of probably 200 per year. So, so yes, uh, our, uh, we, we work with, with everyone if we can. Great. Mr. Chiu Zheng from the Central Bank of, of Taiwan, uh, if you could talk to us a little bit about the role that the central bank plays or will play in this um, in this new initiative, and if you could also explain a little bit more how Cabe, uh, the Central American uh, Bank for Economic Integration, uh, what role it plays, and how Taiwan through Cabe has also gotten involved in in a number of, of technical assistance projects. Okay, thank you, Michael, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's an honor to be in a panelist to discuss this topic. Uh, okay, and uh, as you know, Central Bank, uh, Taiwan's foreign reserve is around 470 billion US dollars. And uh, it's a central bank's responsibility to run this huge amount of money. So we always want to take, to make the most of it. So, uh, in 1990s, Kabe faced the financial crisis. Taiwan stepped in as the first non-regional member of Kabe to help. We inject capital. And the Central Bank, Ministry of Finance, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs reach out to the funding countries to help them. And we, Central Bank, appointed the first staff to vote and speak in the Board of Directors. Through the Board of Directors, Taiwan worked with Kabe to integrate the economy of Central America. I was fortunately to be sent over there in 2012. Over years, Working with my Latin American colleagues, we made uh, aggressive improvement in many areas, in the area like uh, of, uh, financial inter intermediation and uh, energy services and uh, social infra infrastructure and uh, productive construction and uh, environment improvement and even the competitive promotion. I recall at that time, Kabe's, Kabe's rating, credit rating was not so good. The financial, the funding is, was a big problem. But Taiwan was flood of money and uh, Taiwan has outstanding credit rating. So we brought Kabe to Taiwan's capital market to raise funds. And we encourage the financial stage institutions to invest in Kabe. I personally also integrated with the credit rating agencies like the Moody's, S&Ps, to provide Taiwan's fully support to Kabe's credit rating, to boost Kabe's credit rating to investment grade. So right now, Kabe's credit rating is very good and has no problem for uh, collect the funds. But uh, Taiwan's support to Kabe is not only in the uh, financial resources, but also in the technical assistance. I think the backup from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and ICDF is very strong and very powerful. Uh, ICDF, the technical missions, just as uh, General Shang said, it has spread all over the Central American regions. I think it's almost in every corner of these regions to provide technical assistance and even the technical transmission. Mm. 
I remember when I was there, a huge project signed by Kabe and ICDF to save the people suffering from the COVID rust disease, which almost killed the economy of Central America. It was amazing grateful. It was amazing grateful. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, Scott McDonald is one of the few people who for decades now has focused on the relationship between Asia and Latin America. Uh, there are a lot of people that have gotten into that subject in the last few years be because it's become a very trendy topic, but Scott has been focused on it for many, many years. Um, Scott, I wonder if you could share with us your perspective on uh, what we've heard today um, about this new level of cooperation between the US, Taiwan, um, and if you can factor in also um, this underlying issue of the, of the competition between the United States and China in the region. Sure. <laughs> um, I don't know how many people have watched the uh, TD Ameritrade commercial. There's a gentleman sitting there and the able and capable team from TD Ameritrade are asking him why he's not doing a complicated derivatives trade. And the answer from the gentleman is, it's just complicated. Um, if you take a look at relations between the United States and China, it's just complicated. If you throw in to this mix relations between the United States and Latin America, uh, relations between Taiwan and Latin America, um, you know, one of the exercises that you have to think about is how do we connect a country like Haiti to Taiwan, the United States, and China? What's the interplay between these? So let me start off by saying it's just complicated, um, and it's probably going to remain complicated in that regard. Um, the second point that I'd like to make is that there has definitely been a need for more coherent and I would say robust or deliberative US response to the role of China in Latin America. Uh, China has come to the region, I'd say starting off in 2005, in a more pronounced fashion with a voracious appetite for natural resources. Uh, it has come in the form of large state companies and private sector companies and development banks, but it's come with a very large checkbook. And it's in search of markets and partners. And there's also an underside to it, which was mentioned earlier, which we have to pay attention to. So the third point is in dealing with a challenge in the Americas. Um, I think there has to be more focus on economic statecraft. And you know, things that we were discussing today, uh, there seems this is the game that needs to be played in Latin America, certainly in the Caribbean, an area where I have more facility and recently traveled to. Um, and of course, you look at, uh, for Taiwan, the Caribbean and Central America important because that's where the bulk of their diplomatic recognition now sits. The uh, fourth point I would make is more of a focus on economic statecraft does not deny the importance of robust policies in dealing with dictatorships like Venezuela or Cuba. Uh, but it is a complementary factor that is something that should be in all countries' arsenal as to how they deal with challenges in the Americas, but challenges around the world, and also building up mutual cooperation for the same aspirations in our, in our case in the United States, democracy and economic development that's inclusive. The uh, fifth point is the view from the region. Um, speaking to a lot of people in the Caribbean, but also in South America, uh, many countries feel like there's a big fight going on between two large elephants, the United States and China. And it's very difficult at times, if you're a smaller creature, to be caught between the elephants. Um, there's concerns that, you know, inadvertently you make a policy that really makes one of those countries angry, and there are consequences that get played out with it. So I think that's important. And in the Caribbean, this is certainly the case, and Central America. Um, the issues that, that face these countries go everywhere from poverty alleviation to critical infrastructure that needs to be built. Um, certainly, you know, it's been in the news. We saw the Solomon Islands in Kiribati, but recently Haiti, you know, Dominican Republic shifted sides to the PRC. 
Haiti seems to be very much the source or, or a, uh, an arena of competition, huge pressure from China. Uh, I read through some development plans by, I, th I believe it was the, one of the uh, couple of private sector companies, Chinese companies, offering you know, power generation for Port-au-Prince, including a wonderful shiny new metro system. Um, people tend to forget that Haiti is a very poor country, law and order is a challenge in the country, and 60% of the population lives below the national poverty level. 25% uh, of uh, foreign exchange comes from remittances. Uh, Haiti has development challenges, but this is something that certainly is in play. And Taiwan, being a island and being a smaller country, being a democracy, understands a lot of the challenges faced by Caribbean and Central American countries. A um, couple of just, uh, I'd say, two other really quick points here is um, the aspect of a lot of countries in the Caribbean and Central America, they prefer, I think, to deal with the United States. However, it is checkbook diplomacy that often comes into play in development projects. And some of those projects don't go according to plan, but there, there is an attraction to it, and it's dollar diplomacy or however you want to express it, but it is economic statecraft. The last point I would say is I think uh, what has been presented in terms of U.S policy in terms of the economic side and placing more of a stress on economic statecraft in terms of the changes that we've seen in policy. Um, I think it's a very constructive step forward in dealing with the issue of China's influence in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, the only cautious words I would say to that, it reminds me of the scene in Jaws where uh, Richard Dreyfus and uh, Robert Shaw and uh, Roy Scheider is standing there and they finally get a good look at the size of the shark and one of them says, I think we're gonna need a bigger boat. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Scott, thank you very much. Uh, now you all understand why we've invited Scott here this morning. He's always very, very entertaining. But no, those were, were very, uh, very good comments, Scott. Uh, thank you for putting this all a little bit more into perspective. I'd, I'd like to encourage um, questions from the audience. Um, if, if we have any that have been collected, uh, I, I will take them. But I have a couple of questions for Ambassador uh, Yui. Um, we, uh, well, Ambassador uh, Gao spoke about, I mean, mentioned Venezuela. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more from you on Venezuela. Um, Taiwan has come forward with some significant uh, humanitarian assistance recently uh, to the government of, of Juan Guaido. Um, where does Taiwan stand on the whole Venezuela conflict, given that this is a, a, a place where um, big power um, conflict is being is being played out with China, Russia, uh, the United States, uh, Iran also involved. Uh, where does Taiwan come down on that issue? And on the issue of Nicaragua, I'd also appreciate some some comments. Uh, Taiwan has relations with Nicaragua. Um, Nicaragua has been a troubled a troubled location over the last uh, over the last five or six months. Um, where do you all come down on the issue of, of Nicaragua? Uh, thank you, Michael, for a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> Can I answer the first one? No, I'm just uh, in, for Venezuela, well, um, you know, I, I want to point out first that uh, Ambassador Gao mentioned you know, that our former minister just uh, had, had just uh, delivered or turned in the uh, 3.5 tons of uh, very needed medicine. Uh, all, they were for cancer patients, for renal you know, medicine, etc. So they were direly needed uh, uh, supplies in, in, in Venezuela. And, and that just does, that's the first b batch going in. There, there, there will be more more on the way. But with Venezuela, uh, we, we uh, besides being a humanitarian crisis, but also because I think we, we see, it's like looking at ourselves in the, in the mirror somehow. You know, Venezuela, the people of Venezuela under President Guaido, they're fighting for the right to be free, to live under uh, a democracy. Uh, and, and that's what we've been doing for, for many, many years in Taiwan. So, so uh, uh, and our, uh, uh, Contact connection with with uh, with uh, uh, with them uh, didn't just start with 
when President, uh, when Mr. Guaido became the provisional president, we, uh, we actually started uh, a little earlier than that. Uh, and they tell us uh, we were uh, helping them when nobody else cared to, to, to help them. But, but because we, we think that, uh, again, this is like-minded people, so, so uh, we, we help each other. And, and also, you know, the, the, the logo that we have, uh, Taiwan can help. It's not it's just not, not just a logo. It's we really can help, and we want to to uh, to to show that we care, and we really care about the Venezuelan people and, and their in their dire uh, situation. And that's why we decided to, you know, uh, when um, Ambassador Gao was invited to the event in February earlier this year, and where he announced that we would pledge. Uh, 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 help to, to also contribute to, to the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. So that's our take. Uh, we're not trying to play into all these complicated, like Scott said, you know, it's, it's a complicated issue in Venezuela. All these players uh, intertwined in this very, very, uh, but no, for, for us it's just helping people that, that need to be helped and people who, who are uh, struggling like we were and we are, and, and that's, that's just it. Uh, with Nicaragua, well, um, Nicaragua is, is is one of Taiwan's allies. Uh, it has been has has been so for many years, and uh, we understand that there is an issue between uh, uh, the United States and Nicaragua uh, because of the, what has been happening since uh, well. Uh, about uh, some some issues about the, the, their governance and, and the way they, they govern, uh, we we have stated clearly to to, to the U.S. government and, and our friends and our allies also that uh, with, uh, with Nicaragua, uh, they being our allies, we will continue to to uh, 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 collaborate with them, but we make sure that the collaboration that that we do with Nicaragua. Uh, is in line with you know it, uh, help getting to the people. Uh, for example, we have a large technical mission in, in Nicaragua, well, I think one of the largest, uh, and and those those projects benefit directly the farmers, the uh, the women, the the people SMEs and etc. So and also there are some development projects that that also we make sure that it, it, it's benef it benefits the people, uh, and we don't want to try to. And we understand uh, we also sort of play a. Uh, a, a, a bridge between between our two side between the two sides and encourage them to to uh, to find a, a, a viable solution uh, to the problems that uh, Nicaragua is facing uh, today. Okay, a question from the uh, from the audience. Um, since China established diplomatic ties with several former partners of Taiwan uh, over these last years, and I think uh, the person is referring to Panama. Um, El Salvador, the, the Dominican Republic. What has been the impact of China's promised aid? I mean, has there been what, what was promised? Well, let me start with uh, Costa Rica. It was 2007, Costa Rica. Um, about 11 years, 12 years ago. Uh, Costa Rica, you know, it was a beacon of democracy and uh, a model, model country of Central America. And unfortunately, in 2007, they decided to, to switch sides. Uh, let me just uh, why, why Costa Rica, but I'll, I'll, I'll come to the, the other three countries. But prior to 2007, 2006, 2007, Costa Rica had a super avid. They were selling more to China than than, than the, the Chinese were selling to to the Costa Ricans. They had a you know, positive balance in their trade. Uh, 2007, they switched sides. Starting 2008. They start having a deficit uh, in their trade. You know, China was selling a lot more to Costa Rica than, than, than vice versa. So Costa Rica asked to sign a free trade agreement with China so that their products would be more competitive in entering into the Chinese market. Two, 2010, they signed an FTA, and since then, I think their trading balance has been probably 30 times worse than than at 2008 level. So, so it, it tells you. That uh, many of our allies, uh, they 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 are promised by the Chinese that you know if you switch, you know if you're with a correct China, uh, I'm, I'll make sure that you know you you'll, you won't have enough meat to sell to Chinese to China that you know if you know, well there's a pattern every time they start you know, this offensive you know this offensive against against our, one of our ally countries, you'll see an editorial come up in one of the newspapers in that in that country saying for example for example Costa Rica, it came out says. 
you know, Costa Rica, if, you know, China is a, there's a population of 1.2 billion. If each Chinese drinks a cup of Costa Rican coffee per day, there wouldn't be enough Costa Rican coffee to sell to China. And then it came up in, when I was in Paraguay, when the toro came up, you know, China is a big, you know, buyer of commodities. If each Chinese uh, ate one piece of Paraguayan beef per day, there wouldn't be enough meat to sell to China. And you know, this this comes up, but but that's not the case. You know, they uh, they, they 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 make very big promises. Uh, they've made the promises to Costa Rica, to the Dominican Republic, Panama, etc. In Costa Rica's case, they also uh, um, promised to to build a stadium, to build a, a refinery, uh, roads, and uh, I think a, a, a port, Puerto Limón. And at the end, they, they did build a, a stadium. Uh, they used you know, Chinese workers, Chinese materials, everything came from China, and then the Chinese workers stayed, and, and now there's, it's, a, it's a bit of a problem in Costa Rica because they're competing against uh, the local uh, merchants. But all the other promises didn't go through. Uh, in uh, the Dominican Republic, two, a year and a half ago, uh, the, the then director of the China's commercial office in, the, the, in Santo Domingo, I was also touting, you know, say, well, you know, Dominican Republic, you're, you're with the wrong China, you're with the correct China. Uh, as soon as we have an embassy in the Santo Domingo, there will be $800 million worth of investment. You know, they're just waiting at the door. Once we have an, once we have an embassy, they'll just, you know, they'll just pour into to Santo Domingo and start investing in, in your country, and, and plus all these uh, promises. Uh, we talked to the Dominicans recently, and they said, "Well, the, nothing has come in." You know, they also promised that there will be droves of tourists going into the Dominican Republic, the Basque, and the, you know, Punta Cana, and all these wonderful places in the Dominican Republic. We haven't seen much of a Chinese tourists going into, to the Dominican Republic. Which, by the way, uh, we Asians, or especially the women, we don't like sun. <laughs> so selling beaches to the, to the Chinese is not a good idea, by the way. <laughs> uh, El Salvador, it, many of you know this Puerto, Puerto, Cotuco, the Cotuco port, you know, the uh, Puerto La Union. Uh, before before uh, August of last year, they had this company, you know, sitting, saying that they would develop uh, this huge project, a multi-billion dollar project to develop Puerto La Union and all the adjacent Ter territories around La Porta Union. Actually, it involved two thirds of El Salvador's uh, uh, coastline. It, it, they, they, they wanted a 90-year lease, you know, to develop this huge, uh, huge patch of land in El Salvador. But uh, when they established an embassy, the, the company no longer exists. Uh, well, you know, so. So uh, in Panama too, Panama, they were promised many things and, and they say nothing has come in. There, there are direct flights, uh, or there's a, a Chinese airline uh, landing in Panama City. I was in Panama a few months ago, and they tell me the flights are empty. They're not, they're not tourists coming in into Panama. So, so watch out for those empty promises. And if they do invest, as Bernardo mentioned just now, uh, they, they bring a lot of money, they don't ask questions, they don't, you know, for term, in terms of transparency, accountability, you know, they don't ask any questions and just, and, and, and create a lot of problems with the very deficient, uh, in most cases, uh, projects. So, one, you know, on and on again, we, we, we bring these examples to our allied countries and, and to showcase that they're not reliable partners. Uh, Taiwan. Uh, we have limited resources. Uh, we are we're accountable to our Congress. Uh, you know, our, uh, so, but what we promise to do, we always deliver, and, and that's why we tell them, you know, we, we are reliable partners. Uh, we, I was consoled by an ambassador from a friendly country in Taipei uh, last week when we lost uh, Solomon Islands and and, and, and Kiribati. Uh, and so, oh, you know, Mr. Yu, I'm sorry, you know, this happened. So, well, so yeah, but I'm also sorry for Solomon Islands and Kiribati, because you know that's where they're going to get after uh, after they switch sides. They're going to lose all the all the good things that we were bringing. We had medical teams, we had you know technical assistance that were helping them in, in uh, the diet balances. The South Pacific Islanders have problems with their diets. We're trying to you know uh, bring them a healthier healthier lifestyles, but all of that's lost. And they'll they'll end up with you know little or nothing uh, on their hands after they switch sides. 
Well, I think we're going to have to leave it there. We're a little bit over our time. Um, I, I'd like to leave it uh, focusing again on what uh, Scott had to say. It really is complicated. Yes. Uh, these are complicated <laughs> issues. I hope we've contributed a bit to understanding a little bit better um, what is being started here now in terms of this, uh, this bilateral and multilateral collaboration with Taiwan. And we look forward to hearing more about this uh, as, the, as the project goes forward. Uh, if we could all um, give a round of applause to our panelists. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you all very much.